Hello everyone, this is Professor Zafari, and in this lesson we're going to talk about Paris in the late 19th century. In the previous lesson, we talked about the historical and political context of the late 19th century. Paris and the rest of Europe are very much in the midst of the Second Industrial Revolution and with the developments in technology it allows the Europeans to dominate the globe. And not only do they dominate the globe economically, politically, and militarily, there is also a cultural element. The, the Europeans are very much steeped in this ethnocentrism, that their culture, their language, their worldview is superior to everyone else's. So this is what's going on globally. And some of those attitudes are starting to be broken down in specific circles in Europe. And one of those places is Paris. Paris is very much the hub of a lot of the creative and intellectual energy in Europe at this time. It's a place where thinkers and artists and musicians are gathering in cafes and they're collaborating. So that, that creative energy is very much apparent and alive in Paris and it's fueling others, inspiring others as well. So let's talk about specifically one artist, Edward Manet. And the reason we're talking about him is that the main cultural movement of the 20th century is modernism. And modernism's characteristics are breaking with tradition, very self-consciously and even radically willing to break the rules and to go against the norms and to push forward into the future with new ideas. And the modernists call Edward Manet uh, their grandfather, the, the precursor to modernism. He's the one who threw open the doors and very willingly challenged society to make modernism, uh, make the path for modernism flow. So the situation, let's look at the historical and cultural context for Edward Manet's life. The, the time that he's living in, he's a Frenchman, and the time that he's living in, Paris it has considered itself to be the art hub of Europe. And since the Baroque era, the French decided that they wanted to maintain high standards of art. And so they created the Art Academy, or in French, the Académie des Beaux-Arts the Academy of Fine Arts. And this art academy was to be the standards of, of good art so that France would not be um, inundated with tacky art or, or any of those snobbish notions that the French are known for. I'm teasing, of course. But the Art Academy also became, as its name implies, an academy to train artists. And the system in which the academy trained artists was to first and foremost learn the masters, learn the techniques, learn the skills, and learn the compositional styles of those great masters of Western art. So they would study and copy and try to replicate paintings from Leonardo da Vinci, from Raphael, from Titian, from those great Renaissance masters, the Baroque masters such as Rubens and others. So Edward Manet is educated in this system. He's educated in the Art Academy. So he knows their rules. He knows what their standards of good art is. And so when he starts challenging these standards, it's a huge scandal. So let's take a look at what he does. Here is a Renaissance masterpiece by Titian. He was a, um, a Venetian Renaissance painter. Titian was considered the, he was called the sun among the stars for painters. And he paints this. Now, first of all, Venice was more liberal than other cities during the Renaissance, and so the nude was something that the Venetians were very readily accepting. But for Titian and for his society, this is not an obscene or or controversial painting because this is Venus of Urbino. Venus of Urbino is this mythical figure. She's not a real woman. She's not his mistress. She's not someone that you might recognize on the streets. So her nudity is not scandalous because she's not a real woman. And then Manet, of course, knowing these standards and knowing these ideas, and of course having studied Titian's composition, gives us this. 
and he titles it Olympia. So if we look at these two paintings side by side, can you see the similarities? He has very intentionally copied Titian's composition. We have the green drapery in the fabrics. We have the same um, Titian here has given us these interesting brocade fabrics and it indicates too the wealth and all of the exchange going on in Venice during the Renaissance. And so Mani is giving us all of this. We have these luxurious linens in the background, Titian's given us this puppy curled in the bed, and Mane is giving us a cat. So this is considered a masterpiece of Western art, and this is considered an obscene, scandalous, absolute affront to the Art Academy. Why? Here's where Mane proves himself to be that scandalous modern artist. First of all, notice that Mane's figure is wearing slippers in bed. She's wearing these sl silk heels in bed. She's adorned with a bracelet. So is the Venus of Urbino over here. But Mane is calling more attention to it. And he's given her a necklace with a, with a pendant dangling from her neck. And then she's receiving flowers. So let's think for a moment. What, mo what woman would be posed nude wearing her high heels, wearing her jewelry, and posed in bed. Somebody's mistress. And that's what Mane is implying here. She's receiving flowers from a gentleman caller or a john, and she's adorned in bed with these jewelry and her slippers to indicate that she's very much aware of her nudity, and she does mean for it to be provocative. And on top of it, breaking the rules further, Mane has his figure staring right at us. It's not a bashful gaze kind of turned down. His figure is looking straight at us as if she's acknowledging the audience, as if she's acknowledging us looking at her as she lies nude. And then another thing Mane does is he doesn't give us this idealized, uh, sugar-coated notion of a, of a woman who might be the perfect long-legged uh, beauty. She's actually a rather petite woman, and he gives us a very real woman. That, that tends to be very scandalous for his time as well. So this painting, Olympia, is scandalous to the Art Academy at the time, and it causes a great deal of controversy. And the mastery of it, the mastery of it is that Edward Manet knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly how to piss off the Art Academy, and he does it. So there's a wonderful series that the BBC produced, and it's called The Impressionists. And in this scene from that series, I want to play for you um, just this scene that deals with Edward Manet's Olympia, and it really illustrates why his society found this painting so scandalous. As far as Paris is concerned, this will be seen as more of a crime than a creation. I don't paint nimini pimini daubs, Degas. This painting is alive. Olympia is alive. Where's your veil of mythology? He didn't give her one. That, my dear, is quite apparent. Here is a modern Olympia. Ah, Olympia. You won't find her in mythology or antiquity. I know exactly where you'll find her. I could tell you what. Black cat. Beelzebub himself. I needed a touch of black. Well, Titian's Venus has a lapdog. Mine has a cat. A lapdog doesn't signify anything sordid. The salon will have a field day. Where on earth did he pick up this yellow-bellied odalisk? And he has the gall to call her Olympia. Thank God I didn't bring my wife. When art stoops this low, sense is too good for it. A puny model laid out on a sheet. She couldn't move her arms and legs if she wanted to. The least woman has bones and muscles and skin. Some sort of color, I mean. He's trying to do something else. Something else that isn't art. It is art about real people and, and real things. You may be the art critic, Giorgetti, but as far as I am concerned, reality and art are two very different things. It will have to be moved. Here 
here's another scene from the same series by the BBC and it illustrates the power and the influence that the Art Academy had over the artists during the late 19th century in Paris. The Salon, the most important showcase for art in France, that was our battleground. But the Marquis de Chenevière, the new Minister for Arts, was a fierce enemy. His job was to strangle art. For any great nation to recover from war, it must be strong, resolute, united. It is the patriotic duty of every artist to serve France through art. We have witnessed in the streets of Paris how delusions of freedom and revolution lead to violence and terror. Liberty. Equality. <laughs> Fraternity. Work. Justice, public order, that is what this nation needs. Artists of France know this. Reject tradition. And so long as I draw breath, you have no future. And so the power the Art Academy had then is that by by sponsoring these huge art exhibitions that were called the Salon. This was how, excuse me, this is how artists' work was seen. And if your paintings were not accepted to be presented in the Salon, your career was essentially dead. So Manet knows the rules. He's already shocked the public with Olympia, and then he does it again. And one reason Manet can get away with doing this is that he's a wealthy man. He comes from an aristocratic family, his family are rich, he's supported financially by his family. So Edward Manet has the luxury of scandalizing the public because he doesn't have to make his living by selling his paintings. If you choose to watch more episodes of that series, which I highly recommend, you'll see that other artists of the late 19th century, such as such as Claude Monet and, uh, and Renoir and Cézanne, they're suffering quite a bit financially because they cannot make a living selling their paintings. So Edward Manet has the luxury that he's a wealthy man and his income does not depend upon selling his paintings. So he very willingly and, and very provocatively breaks the rules again. He does it this time again by imitating another Renaissance masterpiece. And the painting that you see here in the upper left is another uh, Venetian Renaissance master. And it's Giorgione's painting, Pastoral Concert. And again, for its time, it's acceptable. It's accepted in France and Europe as a masterpiece because it's a mythical setting. It's not real people because it doesn't really make any sense why these two women are nude. It doesn't make any sense. But again, it is a masterpiece because it's not depicting real women and it's not considered in any way provocative or obscene. So again, playing on the composition and the idea of this painting, Manet does this. And if you notice the woman's face, it's the same figure, the same model who would, who would pose for, for Manet's paintings. So we have two clothed men, and rather than playing instruments as they are here, they're having an intellectual discourse, it seems. And we have the back figure bathing in the water rather than drawing water from the well. But this figure is the one who really makes this painting scandalous. Rather than having her back turned to us in this rather private scene, again, Mane paints this figure staring straight at the audience. She's acknowledging that we're seeing her and we're seeing her nudity. So there's no shyness. There's no hint at modesty. It's a very abrupt, it's a very direct acknowledgement of the audience viewing her in her nudity. So Manet again, knowing the rules, playing with this Renaissance masterpiece, intentionally breaks the rules. <laughs> 